This story starts with a princess, an Egyptian, and Donald Trump. It's a tale about how computers are curating our cultural future and how our Kiwi data company found itself in the middle of that. But it starts all the way back in 547 BC when our princess, named Enigaldi, built the world's very first museum. But this museum wasn't like what you and I would know of as a museum today, because it was actually in her home, a palace, and only there for the enjoyment of her inner circle. And with it, our princess started a trend that would be followed by Roman warlords and Danish aristocrats and British scientists, people who kept private collections in their homes, only accessible for a privileged few. And over the years, churches and states and the very wealthy funded the construction of the world's great treasure trove. And along came the big names that we still know today, like the Vatican, founded in 1506 and now boasting 54 museums within the city's walls. And then a few hundred years later, a new museum age began when a rich collector bequeathed his estate to King George II, foreseeing just how important museums would be for sharing the stories of history for future generations. And together, they gave rise to the British Museum, now the most visited museum in the UK. And this was a big leap from private collections. It marked the first move for the memory of humankind, from antiquity's elitism to the public cultural institution. And then the French followed suit during the Revolution with the Louvre. This masterpiece was originally a fortress, converted into a museum and then opened to the public. It is now one of the most popular in the world, seeing over seven million people each year through its doors. And then finally, the US had her turn when one of Britain's scientists, who ironically had never set foot on American soil, left his estate to its people. And with it, James Smithson funded the Smithsonian Institute, which now numbers 19 museums and the National Zoo. It is the world's largest museum complex. And so it continued with arts and culture being a sport of the rich and powerful, right up until the 1970s. And then, picture this. Watergate is happening in the Israeli Six-Day War, and Richard Nixon, with problems at home and abroad, needs some kind of diplomatic gesture he can share with the Egyptians, and with it, broke a peace in the Middle East and achieve a win at home. And so on one foul swoop that killed two birds with one stone, he signed a deal together with his country's top museum directors and Egypt, and brought the contents of King Tut's tomb to the US. This was the most popular exhibition of all time. It was seen by over eight million people. Eight million, that's more than the king had ruled over in his life. And at a time when the halls of the Metropolitan Museum of Art were previously quiet, they broke all attendance records. And with people camping outside the doors of the Met just to get in, they found themselves flying their executives to Disneyland to learn all about the world of commercializing visitor experience. And with it, they brought revenue into the museum. And here we have it, from royalty to the church, from the wealthy to the government, and finally, our modern commercial world. Over the last few thousand years, the history of museums has followed power. And fast forward to today, and in the Met's footsteps, the average museum operates with a mix of government funding, private generosity, and revenue. But for the billion people who visit the world's 75,000 museums each year, the average museum can spend up to $50 for each foot through the door, and yet offset by less than 10 in revenue. And some people will tell you even that is a problem. Culture shouldn't be commercialized, and we shouldn't see visitors as customers. And they'll point to examples like the 9-11 Memorial Museum, and they'll ask you whether you think it is right to sell a toy fire truck at a mass grave site. 
but the reality is that museums need much money to deliver on their social mission. And perhaps the hidden problem is that our old model of grants and funding doesn't fit very well into the modern world. Relying on private funding is a pretty risky business in a global financial crisis. And in many countries, competing for government funds is getting harder and harder. There's no better example of this than with current administrations like Trump's, whose budget right now before Congress will wipe $500 million from the US government's museum funding. And then there's this. Traditionally, museums don't like to think of themselves as competitive businesses. But sadly, on a Saturday morning when it's time for the family to decide what to do with their weekend, things like Netflix are getting in the way of a visit to the museum. This has a social impact, but it has a financial one too. And there's a big reason that we should all care about this, because it is only by truly understanding our past that we can forge a better future. This is so pertinent in today's social climate. For me, the moment when this really struck home was a few years ago, when I found out that a white supremacist had walked into the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and shot dead one of its staff members. It is a very stark reminder. Some parts of history we'd like to think of as behind us are perhaps not over just yet. And that's why our cultural institutions, be they history or science or art, are just so important. So captivated by this industry, I wanted to do something to change the world for museums. So starting at the Auckland Art Gallery over the road, I began by asking, well, what makes a museum tick? And what I found out was, it was this. The answer was clicks. Everywhere I went, I saw clicker counters. Take the Museum of American History, for example. You'll see one of these humble clicker counters sitting proudly on display in the numismatics collection and you'll also see them using it at the front door. So inspired by a little metal device, I founded a company called Dexibit, dedicated to advancing big data analytics in the cultural sector. We use technology to pull together all sorts of information on the visitor's experience to anonymously help museums manage for performance by better understanding where you went, or what you saw or did or ate or bought or even what the weather was doing outside. And essentially, we set out on a mission to get rid of these. Because a clicker counter doesn't tell you much, and traditional ways of thinking about customers don't translate for a curator. Like if your museum is about human rights, like this one in Canada, you can't very well ask your visitors if they were satisfied with their visit after they've just emerged from a heart-wrenching exhibition about genocide. We have to find proxies for measuring engagement, and data science provides us with the means to use things like mobile device signals to look at trail routes and dwell times and work out if the exhibitions are resonating for people like you and me. And then with machine learning, we can forecast how many people will come to a museum, as we did with Te Papa here, down to the hour and up to a year ahead, and even featuring the very subtle influence of the local cruise ship schedule. Knowing visitor numbers in advance helps museums with everything from financial planning to knowing how many muffins to bake next Tuesday. And then for museums who have the wonderful challenge of welcoming an overwhelming number of visitors, like the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture, big data can help us forecast attrition or show rates and ultimately open the museum up to those who would otherwise miss out. And now, with museums who are bringing in big blockbuster special exhibitions, such as the National Gallery in London, we're working on using artificial intelligence to simulate how an exhibition will perform before it even opens. This helps museums make especially important decisions, as many of them only ever show a few percent of their collection at any given time, and then have to spend to bring in travelling exhibits too. But most important of all is what this means for us as visitors. While we've moved on from the days when the museums were invite-only, up until recently, it's still been up to a pretty select group 
to decide what to put in front of us as the public. And what big data analytics does for us is it flips that curatorial pyramid on its head. It allows us to vote with our feet. Big data enables museums to listen rather than just talk, and that turns curation into a conversation. And that'll create more moments like this one, where it plants a seed in the minds of our future scientists and artists. But what I do know is this. In this new age of democratizing the museum, we will better evidence the value of museums to society. Data will help protect us against those recessions and federal budget cuts, and it will help empower the very delicate balance of the museum's pop culture with its social mission. So from Princess Enigaldi to King Tut to Donald Trump, over the years, the place of museums in society has changed. And now I think it needs to change again. But we will only get there if we embrace data to manage the future of our history. Thank you.